The Apollo 11 landing has to be one of the most iconic moments of modern history, and today we'll dive deep in and analyze all of the details about this infamous event. From mysterious anomalies to untold stories, light will be shed on the lesser-known aspects of humanity's greatest achievement. What really happened on that fateful day? Well, let's find out together. These are 20 secrets about the Apollo 11 moon landing. Number 20. NASA's new spacesuit will come with a built-in toilet. Well, I'm not entirely certain why this means that NASA won't go to the moon again. Perhaps they'll no longer need to use the distinctly mediocre rest area on the moon. You know, the one with a grimy bathroom and a vending machine. They don't even have a gift shop. Now, it seems that NASA has made spacesuits into massive, inordinate diapers for astronauts. These new spacesuits come with what is essentially a full life support system in which the wearer can survive for up to six days. That's right, they can poop freely into their astro outfit for almost a week before they start stinking up the place. The astronaut suits are designed to support the crew in the event of a sudden loss of pressure on board the shuttle. They also have a built-in toilet feature so that astronauts astronauts don't have to mess about getting disrobed in order to use the facilities while on a mission. As usual, however, they have fully developed this system for the men. The one that suits the female anatomy is still a work in progress, apparently. Space toilets are always a bit of a conundrum. The astronauts on the International Space Station use a very special space toilet to make their deposits. This space toilet is kind of like a wee and poo hoover. It relies on suction to keep things hygienic, you know, with with no gravity, the simple act of doing a wee is suddenly a dangerously risky business. You don't want a lavatory malfunction to wind up with everyone's gross stuff floating around the space station. Nobody even wants to see that. And this has a fan that pulls the piddle into a tank. To do a poo, the astronauts have to sit over a tank that has that same fan mechanism pulling the plop into a collection sack. The poop then gets sealed into a bag and held in a canister, and that canister holds about 30 bags. Then the whole lot is emptied out with the trash into space. There are literally bags of astronaut poop floating about in outer space. Before we go on, like this video, smash the subscribe button, and click the notification bell right now, or this centipede will crawl on your face when you're sleeping. Now it's time for the sweet topic. The image is an artist's recreation of a pretty crazy rumor that's been doing the rounds. Word on the street is that the astronauts saw some mind-blowing stuff up there, like aliens. Yes, really. Apparently, this is why NASA never returned to the moon. They spotted these weird lights, saw some unidentified craft buzzing around, and had close encounters with extraterrestrial beings. But you know how it goes. Official reports will never mention any of it. Some people think that it's made up or possibly a space-induced hallucination, while others swear that there's a big cover-up going on. Either way, it's a wild story that adds a cosmic twist to humanity's moon landing triumphs. But what do you think? Is it real or is it nonsense? As always, you can let your thoughts be known in the comments section down below using the hashtag Sweet Topic. Number 19. Buzz Aldrin took Holy Communion on the moon. NASA kept it quiet. Back on July 20th of 1969, the astronauts of Apollo 11 were preparing to land on the moon for the first time. As they sat inside of their lunar lander, they had feelings of trepidation and excitement, waiting to be the first humans to step onto this unknown surface. They had to sit and wait for what must have felt interminably long. They feared for what they might encounter. As such, they decided to take a moment before they opened the door into a different world. Buzz Aldrin, it turns out, was a man of faith, in addition to being an astronaut, the guy was also an elder at Webster Presbyterian Church. He had received special permission to take wine and bread into space and perform Holy Communion as one does. So that's what he did, taking communion in the lunar module in the hours after landing as the astronauts prepared to walk on the surface of the moon. Aldrin then said a few words to all of the people who were listening down on Earth at the command center. He took the wine and the bread, the wine floating in 1-6 gravity, while Armstrong declined to participate and sat silently watching. 
This event was kept quiet by NASA, as there had been a big kerfuffle which had resulted in NASA being sued when a few months previously, the Apollo 8 astronauts had read from the Bible when they first orbited the moon. There was also a debate at the time about religion on the moon, so Aldrin was required to keep the prayers to the confines of the landing craft and not bring it onto the moon's surface. Number 18. An Undelivered Nixon Speech About the Moon Landing During the Apollo 11 mission to the moon, there were many uncertainties about how the events would play out. That's the thing with going to places where nobody has ever been and doing things that nobody has ever done. It's tricky to know what will happen. It's also very dangerous indeed to climb into a flaming rocket and be catapulted in a bean can out of the Earth's atmosphere in order to land on the moon and then return safely to Earth. All manner of things could go wrong at any point during the process, but they had to be prepared just in case that things went bad. One of the ways that they prepared for the possibility that the astronauts might wind up stuck on the moon, or lost in space, or any number of other terrible fates, was to write a speech that would be delivered by then-President Richard Nixon. This speech was prepared just in case the two astronauts who landed on the moon were unable to get back to their command module and third astronaut Michael Collins. The speech and its notes also included instructions that Nixon should have followed when calling the potential widows of the astronauts. The speech itself is very moving and is basically outlining what could have happened if the men had been stuck in space alive, but also knowing that they would die there. It is a chilling thought in the end. Number 17. Why Civil Rights Activists Protested the Moon Landing by the time of the moon landing in the summer of 1969, NASA was spending millions of dollars on the space race, and the Apollo space program was at the heart of the colossal investment. The rest of the United States was not receiving such levels of funding, and plenty of people were suffering. When the governments tell people that there is no money for the things that people need for their very survival, for their dignity, to feed their children, but at that same time the government has money to lavish on seemingly frivolous projects which hold no tangible benefit to those same people? Well, that's when troubles can really flare up. During the 1960s, the United States was in turmoil. They were embroiled in an unpopular war in Vietnam, people were in the streets protesting, and the civil rights movement was mourning the loss of its leader, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., who was assassinated the previous year. Clashes became commonplace, and the whole country was at a breaking point. Despite the societal problems that were tearing the people apart, the government was seemingly fixated on the moon. Protests began during the week before the astronauts landed on the moon, and then continued all throughout the summer. In a nation where one-fifth of the people lacked the basics of food, clothing, and shelter, along with medical care. They said that the cost of the space program could have fed the hungry, clothed the naked, tended to the sick, and housed the shelterless. And, you know, they did have a point. Number 16. Why Gil Scott Heron's Whitey on the Moon Still Feels Relevant Today Further drawing attention to the enormous inequalities of American society that were at the forefront of protesting in the era of the moon landings, poet Gil Scott Heron wrote Whitey on the Moon, which highlighted exactly who was enjoying the benefit of these adventures into space. Nowadays, with billionaires like Bezos and Musk cornering the space travel industry and billions of people suffering in poverty, it seems as though very little has changed since 1969. Often hailed as the godfather of rap, Scott Heron considered the moon mission to have been a waste of money when people here on Earth in the United States were struggling. They were told that there was no help for them, but Scott Heron was looking at Whitey on the moon, a huge investment of taxpayer money into something of no tangible benefit to ordinary people. The idea of it being a giant leap for mankind would leave a sour taste in the mouths of people who were still unable to make ends meet in the daily reality of life on this planet planet. Number 15. How Neil Armstrong and Edwin Aldrin Escaped Death to Reach the Moon Apparently, even though it seems that everything went right on the day of the moon landing in July of 1969, there were some things that happened to make it a rather unnerving experience for all involved. As the two astronauts, Armstrong and Aldrin, entered the lunar module, an alarm had gone off. Now, alarms going off is never 
usually a great sign, but they were told by mission control that it was a computer overload and they instructed the astronauts to ignore it and proceed. No doubt they were full of confidence at that point. While they were inside of the lunar module, Armstrong and Aldrin apparently experienced a total communication blackout for almost an hour as the module traveled around the dark side of the moon. When they were restored, they began to attempt the landing, and initially they realized that they were headed directly for an enormous crater. Armstrong had to take manual control of the vehicle in order to guide them to land to safety elsewhere. This extra maneuvering in time taken to land had used up extra fuel, and it seemed that during this moment they might not have sufficient enough to launch from the surface of the moon and return to the command module where Michael Collins was stationed. It was touch and go if they would make it at all. Collins was under instructions to fly back to Earth if the two astronauts were unable to launch from the moon, thus leaving his team behind forever. We know that this didn't happen, but it was certainly a scenario that ran through everyone's minds during these tense reconfigurations and unexpected events. Number 14. Apollo 11 astronauts were in quarantine for fear of moon plague. After the three astronauts returned to Earth following the moon landing in July of 1969, they received a hero's welcome from a safe distance, and then they were locked away in isolation for three full weeks. Now obviously, since nobody had ever been to the moon before, nobody really understood what may be lurking there, waiting to infect our flimsy Earth bodies with some sort of deadly moon plague. So they thought that it was best to take extra precautions with the only humans who had actually been there, or thereabouts in the case of Collins. It was unknown whether there might be strange extraterrestrial microorganisms that could pose a threat to humans, and frankly, the general public was pretty concerned about such things. Once the command module splashed down in the ocean, it was beset on by a bunch of biohazard-suited scientists, and it was thoroughly decontaminated. The astronauts were then sprayed down with bleach, which was lovely, I'm sure, and then flown by helicopter to an aircraft carrier, where they were placed in immediate isolation. There are plenty of pictures of the three men cavorting about for the cameras from inside of an Airstream trailer. This was where they spent a total of 88 hours while on board the USS Hornet aircraft carrier. After this, they were quarantined in Texas until they were finally cleared by NASA's surgeon and then returned to their families in August of that year. Nobody was struck down with moon plague in the end. Number 13. The Moon Smells Like Gunpowder in total, only about 12 people have ever walked on the surface of the moon, and they all agree on one thing, the moon smells like gunpowder. Weird, but it's how Jack Schmidt, an astronaut from Apollo 17, the last manned mission to the moon that took place in 1972, described it. But it's not as if they're standing around breathing in the smell of the moon. I mean, they can't exactly take off their helmets and suck it in through their nostrils, now can they? So how exactly do they know? Well, apparently all of that moon dust and stuff clings onto their spacesuits, and they then tread it back into the ship. Meaning that the smell of the moon is known from the way that the dust smells, and it's actually the smell of unstable minerals. They reckon that space itself actually has a different sort of odor altogether. Apparently, space smells metallic, or something like steak. This, they say, is the scent of dead stars. And throw your hands up in the comments down below if you've never thought about what space may smell like. Number 12. Why planting a flag on the moon was so hard. Although it is an iconic image, apparently poking a flagpole into the surface of the moon was actually a really difficult thing to achieve. Not to mention the fact that this image has provoked seemingly endless conspiracy theories. The flag was created especially to be planted on the surface of the moon, but given the fact that there is no substantial atmosphere there, a few problems arose with this idea. It actually took a lot of engineers and a whole bunch of sums to come up with a solution to the issue. They placed a horizontal crossbar on the top of the flag so that it would stand out and appear to fly. This is one of the main things that conspiracy theorists point point to in the image that they say cast doubt on its authenticity. But it is a basic piece of equipment. It was then supposed to be locked in place at 90 degrees, although it didn't entirely work when it was put on the moon. The base is supposed to have been fashioned so as to make it easier to be driven into the moon's surface, but the astronauts couldn't get the pole to push down the required 18 inches to make it stable. They only managed about a maximum of nine. The whole flag business took a 12-step process and five people in the 
the end, and it's believed that the flag has since fallen over. Number 11. Apollo astronauts left their poop on the moon. Back in the late 60s and early 70s, the concept of taking only photos and leaving only footprints obviously had not quite caught on. To be honest, it still hasn't, but anyways. Of the six Apollo missions that landed on the moon, they managed to leave behind a total of 96 bags of poo. Not only is that absolutely gross, but it's apparently also very interesting to scientists today. Human poop is full of bacteria, usually more than 1,000 different species of microbes, so scientists want to go and see what's left of that and if the moon is still the sterile and lifeless place that it once was. The astronauts, by leaving their waste on the moon, began an inadvertent science project that left human waste in the most extreme environment that it's ever been exposed to. What happened to it under those conditions is of great interest to people who study such things. And even so, who knew that astronauts were such terrible litter bugs? Number 10. What Apollo 11 astronauts ate for the first official meal on the moon? Astronauts have a variety of foods that are available to them. According to NASA, there are famously freeze-dried items, also some dehydrated ones. Some need some kind of preparation, and the others are ready to eat. But which ones did they choose for the very first meal that was eaten on the moon? The first food that was eaten in space was actually by the Soviet cosmonaut Yuri Gagarin, the first man in space. He had beef and liver paste out of an aluminum tube. It sounds gross, and certainly seems to have lacked any ceremony. The first American in space, John Glenn, sucked some applesauce out of a tube. It seems as though tubes were all the rage in space dining. But what did the Apollo 11 guys go for? Well, according to Armstrong and Aldrin, after they had done all that stuff on the surface of the moon, they ate a meal of four bacon squares, three sugar cookies, peaches, pineapple grapefruit drink, and coffee. Number 9. Apollo 11 heart rate data reveals the tension of the first moon landing. While the Apollo 11 astronauts were traveling to the moon and back, they were monitored as closely as the technology of the day would allow. One of the things that was studied was the heart rates of the men as they went on this unknown journey. Armstrong's heart rate was transmitted back to Earth as the Apollo 11 crew would orbit the moon. His heart rate showed to be a steady 110 beats per minute during this time. But then, as the crew would encounter more problems and became closer to the landing and all those alarms were going off, the fuel was running low and the anxiety of the situation increased, naturally, so did Armstrong's heart rate. As they landed on the moon, it would reach its highest and was absolutely racing by the time that they got there. And you know, yours would be as well now, wouldn't it? Number 8. Buzz Aldrin declared moon rock at customs after Apollo 11 landing. Going through United States customs can be a moment of sweaty anxiety, even if you absolutely know that you positively do not have any vegetables with you. It still has the ability to make you feel like a carrot smuggling criminal. So what should you do if you have some sort of extraterrestrial object on your person? Well, it turns out that the Apollo 11 crew still had to clear U.S. customs and even fill out that form declaring any goods that they were bringing into the United States. Buzz Aldrin declared his moon rock and moon dust samples, even though this may have been with the slightest touch of irony. Number 7. NASA's Dirty Secret one of the unexpected problems of all the moon missions from the Apollo era was that of dust. Moon dust is apparently really messy stuff, and it gets absolutely everywhere. The dust was very fine, like flour, but still very rough, like sandpaper. And it caused all manner of problems on board the spacecraft with the astronaut suits. The dust would find its way into various equipment and the creases of the spacesuits, which essentially gummed up the works, making it hard to move or damaging equipment. The abrasive quality of the dust added another dimension to the difficulties, as it could actually wear through the layers of the high-tech fabric that was used in the boots of the astronauts' suits. And it's almost impossible to get it off of any surface, since it's prone to static cling. In fact, the dust had further reaching health implications for the astronauts, as the fine powder of lunar dust actually gave them lunar hay fever. Number 6. Is the Apollo 11 Lunar Module Ascent Stage Still in Lunar Orbit? When the Apollo 11 landed on the moon, they left a piece of the ship in orbit, and it may well still be there today. 
The Eagle lunar module ascent stage was left in the lunar orbit when the Apollo 11 crew touched down on the moon in July of 1969. Nobody is really sure what happened to it after that, but after crunching a lot of scientific numbers and doing a bunch of clever calculations, the people who like working on these things figured out that it's probably still going round and around and around the moon and has stabilized in its orbit over that long time. It's just another piece of space trash that's been left out there by the humans. Number 5. How do NASA's Apollo computers stack up to an iPhone? Maybe you're watching this video on an iPhone, or perhaps you have one in your hand as you idly scroll through TikTok nonsense at the same time as watching this on yet another screen. Such is the modern world, you know. But you probably did not know that your iPhone has a processor in it that's estimated to run at about 2,490 megahertz. That's 100,000 times more than the computer that was used to navigate the Apollo 11 in 1969. It is mind-blowing. The Apollo 11 computer was closer in power to a calculator than it is to a modern smartphone. And although it was smaller than many computers of that era, it didn't require a whole room, but it fit into a box just a few feet wide and was 10 years ahead of commercial computing stuff that was available at the time. It still sucked compared to your own pocket phone, but think of it this way. If they could use that archaic technology to send people to the moon, then why are you still using yours to watch cat videos? Number 4. Armstrong claimed his famous mankind speech was misquoted. When Neil Armstrong hopped out of the lunar module onto the surface of the moon for the first time, the whole world was listening to his speech. Except apparently, everyone heard it wrong. Armstrong claims that his famous words were misquoted. While everyone on Earth heard him say, that's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind, he says that what he actually said was, that's one small step for a man, etc., which would make more sense to be honest, but according to Armstrong, nobody ever heard it. And he even says that when he listens to the recording, he can't hear it either. It's weird, but perhaps some aliens had intercepted the transmission and stole that A. Those darned aliens. It's always aliens. Number 3. Who Made Apollo 11's American Flag? Well, according to a woman named Dolores Black, she did. Black was a former flag seamstress from Milwaukee, and she said that the flag that was poked into the surface of the moon on that first manned landing was in fact her own handiwork. Somebody had to make it now, didn't they? She even says that she signed her work. Officially, the story is that it's uncertain who manufactured the flag. The paperwork for the flag all seems to state that it had been bought off the shelf from either a local store or from a government stock catalog. All of this would make sense, although they did have to spend a lot of time figuring out that pole and how to get the flag to look jolly in the photograph, but there's no indication that the fabric itself was special, or actually created any different from any other flag. And so, if Dolores Black says that she recognized her own craftsmanship, then who the heck are we to argue? Number 2. What were Neil Armstrong's famous first words on the moon? Well, we've actually already established what these were a mere two points ago, but apparently those pesky aliens have been at it again and seem to be doing some sort of memory experiment on us here at the Fancy Banana. So do you remember them? What did Armstrong actually say? Did he say, that's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind? Or did he say what he thought that he had said, which was, that's one small step for a man, one giant leap for mankind? We might as well get stuck into it in the comments down below at this point. I mean, can you hear the missing A? Did Armstrong fluff his lines? Was it aliens? Go on and get your opinion on in the comments section down below. You know you want to. My pet guinea pig Twinkle's got her spacesuit on and she's waiting to see what you say. Number 1. Moonbound Apollo 11 crew couldn't get life insurance, so they did this. Astronauts have one of the riskier jobs out there, so it seems that they're more likely to need life insurance than a whole lot of people might. Except the trouble with having such a dangerous occupation is that no insurance company wants to take the risk of covering you and your crazy death wish job. The Apollo 11 crew could not get life insurance, so they began signing autographs. 
hundreds and hundreds of them from the day that they were announced as being the crew for the moon landing attempt. They signed special ones on envelopes, which were postmarked at the post office to prove the dates, the most valuable of which were from the day that they left to go to the moon. The idea was that if they did not return, then their family could sell these autographs as a kind of insurance policy payout. They returned safely, of course, but these postmarked envelope autographs do sell for as much as $30,000 today. So it was a pretty good idea after all. Well, we finished orbiting the moon for the day. Thanks for coming along for the ride. What did you think of all these interesting moon landing facts? And which of these things surprised you the most? As always, let me know all your splendid thoughts in the comments down below. And may we all hope that when Elon Musk eventually lands on the moon, he steps into an enormous pile of poo. <laughs> Be sure to check out the other cool stuff that's showing up on the screen, and I'll see you next time. I love you.